Throughout every empire, whether Goon Swarm Federation or the Amar Empire, one thing remains constant in every doctrine, in every culture, and in every time and place. The Capsule and the Clone. And this is going to be a brief overview of both. Traded between the Jove and the Kaldari nearly a century ago, the Capsule has come to shape the face of New Eden. Interestingly enough, when it was first introduced to the Kaldari, things went relatively badly. And while the capsule did offer unbridled control and awareness of your ship, it came with many downsides. The mind of the non-Jovians didn't have the genetic enhancements of the Jove. Many early pilots suffered mind lock, which was the inability of the brain to cope with the difference between being a warship hundreds of meters across and a weak human who may only be a couple meters tall. The result is a person who can't move or speak and is trapped inside their mind for the rest of their living days. In fact, the first of the Capsuleers, a man by the name of Prokodin, had this fate befall him on the first ever non-Jovian pod test. Though, you can prevent Mindlock by training for years to become stronger before you enter the capsule. Though, even with the ability to prevent Mindlock, it wasn't the only objection pilots had to the capsule. They also had the thought of having wires and tubes hooked into their body from the hydrostatic pod. It just didn't appeal to them and still doesn't to many pilots, which only made the horror stories push pilots further from the technology. All of these reasons and more were the backbone behind why the capsule technology lay without use for many years. For many years before now, there was cloning actually. But unlike the cloning we have today, it was relatively unreliable. Not to mention some groups had moral and religious objections to cloning as well as the research done in the field. These people, who were called Doomies, were able to exert an oppressive amount of pressure on the way cloning was perceived by the general public. And though many major corporations, marketing, and lobbying have yielded more acceptance in the past two decades, nothing could shake the shoddiest part of the operation, which was, of course, the replantation of the brain into a new body. You see, at the exact moment of death, you essentially have to take a very intense scan of the brain, which also fries it. There can't be any room for error. So in the early days of cloning, people would have to carry around these devices with them. Even still, these devices could go off with negative stimuli, leaving healthy people as vegetables, or they could fail to go off altogether. Almost 19 years ago, though, all of the problems with cloning and capsules seemed to get much better. There was a breakthrough in YC-104. The first transneural burning scan interface was successfully installed into the capsule, and this technology, that within six months of testing would allow for perfect clone transplantations to happen, had an accuracy and reliability that had never been seen before in the cloning industry. At this point, using the considerable new capital at their disposal, the cloning corporations launched a horrendous and truly awe-inspiring marketing campaign. This allowed them to push themselves into the spotlight, and after six months, the transneural burning scan interface was finalized, and the public perception had been primed. At the same time this was happening, Concord prepared and adopted legal acts, which required every single manufactured capsule to be fitted with a transneural echo burning scanner, in addition to mandating clone contracts for every single pilot cleared to fly a capsule fitted vessel. The official rationale given for these laws was that an increase in the viable applications of capsule equipment would allow for further exploration along the technological frontier, as well as trackless fathoms of deep space. It was, of course, widely whispered that the cloning companies had used their megacorp backing to affect these legislative changes, but those theories were never conclusively proven. Whatever its real causes, the fact remained. The capsule and the clone were now inextricably joined, the legislative mandate consolidating their bond. Thus was born the pod pilot. It should be noted that becoming a capsuleer is still a highly dangerous road to take. Aside from the mental and physical training, which can place the trainees under immense stress, the added component of catatonia is still a constant possibility. In effect, a capsuleer in training does not and will not know whether or not they are predisposed through genetics or general constitution to complete their training course until after the fact. To this day, the mere mention of capsuleer to a baseliner can result in a reaction of high stress and dread. 